Welcome to the Hockey Writers Blackhawks Banter, a weekly show with our top Chicago Blackhawks writing crew, bringing you the latest news, rumors, trades, player grades, game results, and much more. From training camp to the playoffs, from Chelsea Dagger to the Madhouse on Madison, our team covers everything that happens with the Hawks. So get comfortable, grab a beverage, it's time for some Blackhawks Banter. Blackhawks Banter. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blackhawks Banter, presented by the Hockey Writers. It's the 71st episode of Blackhawks Banter, which is the Philip Kurashev episode and the Lucas Walmart episode. If you guys remember him, that was kind of a blast from the past there. Um, I'm your host for today, uh, Brooke Laferno, and I'm here with Connor Smith. He's our other contributor, and I'm so glad he could be here today. Thank you, Connor, for joining me today. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me, Brooke. Uh, Obviously, the trade deadline has kind of come and gone, and we got about a month left of games here in the season. Uh, No playoffs this year, unfortunately, but that's kind of what you expect when you're rebuilding. So it's all about playing for pride at this moment, and we'll just see how this goes. Definitely agree. We have a lot to talk about, so we'll get into that in a second. But for those who are watching, um, Gail could not be here today, which is uh, why Connor's here. Connor could gratefully be here today. So I'm excited about that, but she'll be here next week. So fear not. Um, Before we get into everything we need to talk about today, um, I want to remind everyone to um, subscribe to the morning skate newsletter from the hockey writers. It's a newsletter that will get sent to your email Monday through Friday. Um, The link will be in the description. It's morningskate.io. You just put in your email address and that's all you got to do. And you'll get a newsletter Monday through Friday of the best hockey content around the league that you cannot find anywhere else. It is the best um, you can find just kind of tidbits around the league and NCAA, and it's really fun. And I really got, hope you guys subscribe to it because it truly is awesome and you won't regret it. So please make sure to subscribe and also make sure to follow us on Twitter. Our usernames are right up here so we can continue to talk on Twitter. And now let's get into it because like Connor said, we got a lot to talk about. This is a rebuilding team and there's a lot of aspects here. So we got to start with talking about the week that was. It was kind of a surprising week. Would you agree? <laughs> I would agree. So, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of surprising. Um, They won two out of three games um, against Anaheim in L.A., but then lost in overtime against Vegas after surrendering a three to nothing lead. We don't need to dwell on that. That was kind of heartbreaking and really sad, but we should try to hash it out the best as we can. Right. So I guess let's start with what went right for the Blackhawks this week. Well, I guess I'll start with the obvious. Uh, The Alex DeBrincat, Dylan Strome, Patrick Kane first line just continues to click. Um, that first line, each of those players had multi-point games throughout the road trip. And by now we've really been seeing the success go on between the trio for, I would say, give or take about a month now. Um, They had some pretty big games earlier here in the month of March. So you would kind of, you know, figure by at this point, um, you know, just given that we haven't necessarily seen this sustained success in the past with this trio before, you would think that okay, maybe some opponents would begin to figure these guys out a little bit, um, especially uh, with someone like Dylan Strome, because I wrote an article back on it a while back, um, just because like, you know, with Alex DeBrincat and Patrick Kane, they necessarily haven't had um, that top center to play with for a while now. Um, But I think it's a good thing because it's continued providing consistency, which even even as you're rebuilding, even if winning isn't really a goal, that's still something you want. Um, So the energy has been fun. I, again, I don't think it's a long-term solution, but to see that energy kind of uh, level out over an extended period, I think is really encouraging. Um, The depth came through. Uh, You have some unexpected contributors on the scoreboard. So not just that first line. Uh, Jake McCabe had a couple of assists. Uh, Taylor Radish, new pickup, and Sam Lafferty both had a goal against LA. Um, So of course the top line isn't just doing all the driving. So I think Steps like those are small, but very encouraging. And it kind of leads me into my next point, which is, okay, like I said, the trade deadline has kind of come and gone. Now you're at a point where you know you're not going to make the playoffs. So there is a little less pressure now that that's out of the way. You're playing for pride, which can be a good thing, a bad thing. It kind of depends how you look at it. But the pressure's off for these guys. They can just go out and they can kind of relax. And my final point, as far as positives go, is, Dominic Kubelik uh, got on the score sheet on Saturday against Vegas for the first time. And I want to say nine games, his third goal in just the last 22 games. So obviously that was very encouraging. You know, I know he was scratched against the Kings and 
you don't want to see something with a guy like that, especially, you know, just a couple of years ago, we thought he was going to be a major centerpiece of this offense moving forward. Doesn't really seem like it right now, just given his status, but to see something like that is really encouraging. So despite that loss on Saturday, I thought there were a lot of positives actually from this road trip. Yeah, I agree. Um, you kind of made a good point, actually. I'm kind of laughing myself about um, people not being able to figure out the top line of Kane, DeBrinket, and Strom. And that kind of can go for the same for around the league. I don't know how these players just can't figure out certain lines. They're just hard to play against, but that's what you need in this league to win. And I think you wrote about this in your recent article um, from takeaways from the Vegas game. I don't know if Strom is going to be here beyond this year. There's so many like conflicting reports there, but like you said, it works for now. So keep it that way. That's what mm-hmm. you want to see. Just things that work because so many things are not working. And that's, you know, that's something to cling to. And like you said, the pressure's off. There's no trade deadline now. There's no playoff push. You're not in the midst of it. So just play your game, see what you got. And that's kind of where you get the best hockey out of people a lot is when the pressure's off. So we'll see. Hopefully they can carry that on. But I think something that went right was they scored, I think, one power play goal in Anaheim. And then after that, um, they haven't. But they scored three goals on L.A. and four goals on Vegas that were not power play goals. That's huge because usually they need the power play to win them games half the time. And that hasn't been clicking for them lately but they didn't need that this week and that was really refreshing like you said Sam Lafferty Dominic Kubelik people that are kind of unsuspecting but again that's what you need I'm a little upset that it took them this long to figure it out that okay this is what you needed to win games and it hasn't been there all year except now but like you said let's just enjoy it because got to hold on to something right so I was actually impressed that they didn't need the power play as much as they usually do and that was nice to see um so I guess that brings me into our next point about what went wrong here especially against Vegas what went wrong here well I think looking at the Vegas game specifically because um of course I watched that whole game and the first two periods were awesome you know just if you're a Blackhawks fan very complete however I think that lack of pressure that I was talking about that they're currently experiencing I think that can be a double-edged sword because on one end it's like okay you know you're not going to make the playoffs this year let's go out, let's go have some fun. But on the other, you don't want to get overconfident, nor do you want to relax too much. And of course, I'm not Coach King, you know, I'm not one of those players. So I don't know what was going through their heads back then. But Vegas, they were a team that was desperate. I mean, that win could pay huge dividends for them just because they've kind of had their struggles too. They've really been hit hard by the injury bug. Um, But just because you're playing for pride and the pressure's off, Like I said, you don't want to relax too much because it can have negative effects. And we saw what happened there in the third period on um, Saturday. And then just to quickly touch on the other two games a little, I thought Wednesday's game against Anaheim was probably the most complete game of the road trip. Um, Thursday's game, the Hawks were actually, despite the 4-3 shootout win, the Hawks were actually outshot 46-31 to and the power play was 0-4. for So again, it's all about, I think, at the end of the day, capitalizing on those opportunities on the small chances, whether it's winning face-offs, you know, putting a certain sequence together, because when you're a rebuilding club, like I said, just because winning isn't a goal, you know, you still want to see growth markers. You still want to see some level of consistency at the end of the day, because it's really encouraging, I think, both for the fans and the players. So again, just small steps like those, but really other than the Vegas game, I don't have a lot of complaints. I thought by all means, five out of six points, I'll take that. (laughs) I know. And that's what's so frustrating. It's felt like, okay, they got two wins. Oh my gosh. Finally, some consistency. Cause they don't usually string together wins. It's usually win, loss, loss, win, loss, loss. Like, so that was like, okay, finally great. And then Vegas was like, okay, really? Now we're back to this again, but you're right. I think about Vegas, you can't take a desperate team for granted. Even if you're up by three goals, you just can't. And on paper, Vegas is a better team than the Blackhawks are. That's just what it is. They kind of showed that they are better by what happened, but like you said, you just can't take teams lightly. Even if you're up by six goals, you just can't let your foot off the gas. And I think that also is part to do with defense a little bit too. The defense, I don't know what it is with the late game defense. It usually starts out really good. And then you're like, oh my gosh, they're turning a corner. This is great. And then towards the end of the game, you're like, what the heck is this? And like Seth Jones even said, this miscommunication on defense has been a problem for a while and it usually happens in dire moments. So I still don't know what that is. It wasn't towards the end of the game there. At least it was the start of the third period and not like five minutes before the end of the period, which is usually what happens, but there's something still wrong with that defense and I can't put my finger on it. It's just, they fall apart at the worst 
times. They look strong and then really bad. So that to me is what went wrong. Um, Cause obviously the offense was okay for the most part and goaltending I thought was okay, but yeah, just a lot of issues that just not consistent. That's like you said, it's the right. consistency issue. Mm-hmm. It's just a problem. I don't know what to say about that, but hopefully they'll kind of turn the corner again. If they can string together two wins like they did, they can do it again. I'm sure of it. Um, so I guess because I just kind of mentioned goaltending, that's actually my next um, point. So obviously it's been a week since Mark andre Fleury was traded. I'm still upset. <laughs> I think we're all still grieving a little bit, even though we're happy for him, but it's hard to lose a goalie like that. But so we saw Kevin Lincoln in play two games and then Colin Delia played against LA. So we saw both of them this week. Um, so what are your observations from the goaltending this week from both Lincoln and Delia? What did you think about what you saw? Um, I think looking at the games and looking at the numbers um, in terms of their play, I think it's about what I'd expect because obviously, as we know, Kevin Lankin and um, I think for the most part, he looked pretty good last year in his rookie year. And then he's had a little bit more um, of those inconsistencies this year, I think. But Wednesday was obviously a nice performance going uh, 27 of 29 on shots. And then unfortunately, 29 of 34 on Saturday. Um, I Again, I don't think the collapse was entirely his fault, but I think those first two goals, it was a uh, William Carlson and Chandler Stevenson specifically were kind of ugly. I think those are two he probably could have had. So again, I know he's still young. Um, he has a lot to grow going forward, but I think time will really tell with Lincoln moving forward because he's always been a guy that I've rooted for who I've wanted to see do well, because if you look at where he's played in the story, um, it's very inspiring, but Again, it's just about finding that consistency, which I know we keep going back to it, but he hasn't really had that this year. Um, But if he can build up a performance like Wednesdays, I think that would be great. And then um, with Colin Delia, I would say in terms of his performance against the Kings, I'd say definitely very surprising. I mean, he went 43 of 46 on shots, um, which is nice to see. It was his third appearance with the Hawks this year. Um, It's definitely kind of he's definitely turned the tide from that first game I think it was against Nashville um, back on yeah on January 1st where he let in like three goals on seven shots or something like that so it's definitely a positive I mean he's 27 years old so I think at this point he might be running up out of opportunities to you know make him a long kind of make himself you know a long-term piece not just for the Hawks but in the NHL but He's always a guy who, again, I've wanted to see succeed. I've wanted to see do well. And while I do think he might be running out of chances to kind of succeed in the NHL, if he can build off something like that, then it's maybe it'll be a fun storyline, you know, the rest of the season. You know, a guy who's had his chances, has kind of floundered a little, but we'll see what he can do. And again, I think a performance like that, especially it was his hometown teams too. So again, that's a positive right there. Yes, I, I agree with that for sure. I was actually impressed by both of them, to be honest. There's hiccups there, of course. There's not, we can't expect perfection from the position that they're in. There was hiccups, but for the most part, it was better than I thought, considering the opponents that they had. Um, like you said, Lankinen has struggled with consistency issues this year. I don't think a lot of that's his fault. He was stuck behind Mark andre Fleury, and I say that in the best way possible because he was learning from a great guy, but he didn't have the consistent starts that he did last year so a lot of it was kind of touch and go um and then Colin Dealey I was actually um a little worried when I saw he was going to play because like you said his last appearance was really bad and I was a little worried about that but he actually was really impressive to me too something that sticks out to me of what happened this week though is that they seem to get the team seems to get floundered if their goaltending gets really shaky and I kind of saw that with Flurry too if Flurry let in a bad goal he trusts himself. He knows he can rebound. It doesn't seem like the team has that confidence in Lincoln and Indelia. And you kind of saw that in Vegas. He let up that really bad goal. That was the first goal that was really, like you said, really bad. And then it seemed like they just fell apart from there. Like they don't have the confidence to think that if they let up a goal that they can still win. That to me is a little concerning, even though I thought they played really well. So my observation is that I think, like I said, they did well considering the circumstances that they were in. It was unfortunate that they couldn't pull out the wins as I thought they kind of deserved all of the wins the goaltending did. But mm-hmm. um, like, there's a lot of, like you said, positives to take from it. Um, Lincoln and Indelia have obviously been there for a bit now. We're kind of getting used to seeing them, but it's perfect for where they're at right now. They don't need more or less from them. They just need them to be who they are. So they did that, in my opinion. 
So I guess I want to ask you, it's kind of a tricky question because like we said, we know we're going to see them. Flurry's not here anymore. So does their performance either way make you want to see more or less of one or the other? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Hmm. Um, I guess if you ask me if I want to see more or less of them, not necessarily just because I think I don't think either of them is a long-term solution. I mean, to start with the obvious, Colin Delia, um, since he made his debut back in 2017, I think, like I said, he's just kind of been there. He's done well for Rockford, but he hasn't really had that breakthrough of success in the NHL. Whereas if you have someone like Lincoln and who I think is around the same age, maybe I think a year younger. Um, the thing with Lankinen is that even if the results aren't pretty, I guess if there's one who I want to see more down the stretch, it's Lankinen, not necessarily because he's the better goaltender, but also because you've got to remember he's an unrestricted free agent after this year. So I think his performance over, you know, this next month or so could go a long way in determining what his future could look like. Because you consider next year's team, I mean, there are some good names on the free agent market. Obviously, you have, I mean, there's Flurry, but there's also people like uh, Jack Campbell, Darcy Kemper. But I think it's unrealistic that the Hawks make that kind of splash just because of the situation um, that they're in. So if he, you know, if Kevin Lincoln and if he has another performance like how he did against the Ducks uh, this past Wednesday, and again, even those first two periods on Saturday against Vegas, I thought were pretty solid. You know, even though he's a free agent, they might want to keep him because you only have so many options. I mean, Arvid Soderblom's waiting in the wings. Um, people like Drew Camesso, who was on the Olympic team, Team USA. They just got uh, Jackson Stauber, who's a 22-year-old uh, college free agent for Providence. And obviously, his future is probably a little way off. Um, but there's only so many options that you can go to. So I think if Lankin, in, you know, if he does well, and even if he does kind of struggle, I think his performance over this next month will be really interesting. Just to kind of gauge what his future might look like, because at the end of the day, like I said, there's only so many options and maybe it'll be a situation next year, which is, which will be maybe kind of similar to what we saw last year in the, uh, the platoon, uh, so to speak that we saw with him and Malcolm Subin, Maybe it'll be something like that, but I think Lankinen's performance especially is going to be interesting just because I, I think it'll go a long way in determining what role he could have on this team next year or maybe somewhere else in the league. Yeah, Lankinen was always someone that intrigued me as far as trade wire goes, not for us specifically, but for other teams. I actually thought he might be gone at the deadline because you look at the Edmonton Oilers or the Toronto Maple Leafs or the Detroit Red Wings. It was like, really, can you guys get any worse in goal? Like Lankinen, I understand he's not perfect. He's good, though. He's got to be. He's better than I think a lot of goaltending in the league right now. But that kind of makes me think in a way, Lankinen has been here for a bit now, but I feel like Fans have seen kind of, I think he's more established in that way. You know what you're going to get out of him. And he pretty much, like you said, it's consistently that you know what you're going to get. He kind of is what he is at this point. And I would say the same thing about Colin Delia because he's been here a while, although he hasn't gotten as many starts or opportunities maybe as Lankinen has. So I would actually say that I know that Derek King said Lankinen is their guy going forward. He even wants to try him in back-to-back -back nights. But I'd actually kind of be interested in seeing Delia a little bit down the stretch, too. I think Lankinen will have a lot of interest in the trade wire, whether or not he starts um, in the mm -hmm. offseason. But Colin Delia, I think, is a little important, too. If his future is kind of in limbo, you need to showcase him, too, if you want to get anything for him. So, And especially if he played like he did, you can't go wrong with that. So, like you said, you really can't go wrong I guess with either wanting to see more or less but I wouldn't mind seeing a little bit more of Colin Delia down the stretch here too so we'll see but I think that'll be really interesting to keep following so I guess that kind of brings us to our player shout outs of the week where we each pick a player um, to highlight this week either whether for good or bad reasons but I think you and I are both having good reasons to yeah. shout out players this week so you wanted to highlight who uh, Taylor Radish. I got to talk about one of the the, uh, the new guys here. And I think um, along with someone like Sam Lafferty, who is kind of an under the radar pickup, who is kind of heated up a little bit. We saw the same thing with Taylor Radish, who I mean, he's just been here for 10 days now, uh, more or less coming over for from Tampa in the Brandon Hagel trade. But just to look at some stats, 
uh, four points in five games since the trade, including a goal against Anaheim and an assist against the Kings. Um, I think, you know, he is just a rookie still. His development was kind of slow in Tampa, just having those 12 points in 53 games before coming over. Um, I know some people said that maybe he has some room to kind of improve in his skating, especially at the NHL level. But I think this is a situation where he might have a better chance to succeed uh, in Chicago with the rebuilding process because you look at Tampa and I mean, they're just stacked. They know what they're getting into. They know where they're going to go because they're trying to go win that third cup this summer. Whereas if you have someone like Radish, who even if, you know, he's not necessarily a staple in this rebuild or he just sticks around for however many years is more of a, bottom six guy as opposed to a top six guy. If he, you know, if he keeps playing like he's been playing and keeps getting these opportunities, I definitely think it's a good thing because not only is it encouraging, but it also kind of maybe will let us know a little bit about what his future could look like. You've got to remember, I mean, he had a pretty solid career in juniors uh, with the Erie Otters of the Ontario Hockey League, which is where he played with uh, Alex DeBrinkett and Dylan Strom. So it's kind of come full circle and also put up pretty good numbers um, in the American Hockey League with Syracuse uh, AHL's club. So I think you can make the arguments, I think, on both sides of the Hagel deal. But I think this is a nice pickup for Davidson because, like I said, we don't know if he's going to be a fixture of this team long term. But I think we might see some similar situations like this where you have guys come in, maybe they're kind of hot and cold, but it's interesting because it just gives a situation in which it allows fans, you know, other players to see what this team could evolve into. And at the end of the day, I hope he keeps it up. I don't know if he will because, I, like I said, is skating. There's still areas I think that maybe he might need to work on, but it's one of those things where – Again, he might just be a bottom six guy, but we'll see how this goes, especially here with this last month. Yeah, Taylor Radish actually reminds me of Dylan Strom a lot when I watch him. Sometimes I think I am watching Dylan Strom when I watch him, and that's not a bad thing at all. His skating, like you said, is a little – which Strom I know has been criticized for his skating his whole career, but Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you can't shoot the puck, and both of them can shoot the puck. So, you know what, I'll give that to them all day long. So he seems like he might be more of a one – kind of dimensional player where he can score, maybe not two-way player, but he can score. And I'm okay with that because we need scoring. And, you know, like you said, I don't know if he's part of the future here, but that's part of kind of like the no risk with Kyle Davidson there because he's on an entry-level deal. So if he doesn't keep it up and he ends up kind of going downhill, then it doesn't hurt the Blackhawks in any way. But for what he is right now, especially in five games, you can't ask for more from someone that's just kind of coming in here and figuring things out. So I hope he does keep it up because he's been fun to watch so far and he's performed a lot better than I thought he would. Um, Cause you know, we didn't think he was going to be Brandon Hagel coming back, but you know, but he's doing pretty well. So I got to, yep. you can't not give him credit for that. That's really good. Um, and I think that kind of goes into my pick, which is Kubelik. I know I mentioned him a few times on the show, but I always said every time he scored, I'm going to highlight him because it's like a, a momentous occasion here uh, whenever he scores and he did and you know what I don't I'm not as worried about Kubelik I still think he's got it he's got the skill and he's got the talent he's just having a really bad year so I'm not worried about him being able to regain kind of that but it's just been a really tough year for him and I know all players kind of go through that but I was happy to see him score especially because he got scratched the game before and then he scores with Vegas and you know what Philip Kurashev got scratched um, the day before the Winnipeg game or the game before, and then he came back and scored. So you know what? If this is what it's going to take to help him score, they should probably just interchangeably scratch these two players Uh if that's all it's going to take. Same thing with the whole team. Scratch anyone, and you know what? That might just be it. Uh, Derek King is on to something here. It's proven something. They're now getting goal scoring. So, hey, let's take it as we get it. And I'm really proud of Kubelik for coming back and making the statement. He said he got the message. Um, I think fans got the message too. when they saw that everyone was like, "Uh Oh, here we go. But um, like I said, happy for him. It has not been an easy year for him. It's been hard actually to watch him like that because you know, it's there and it's just not working out for him this year. So hopefully he ends up um, ends the season stronger than he did the first half of the season. So that's something to definitely keep an eye on. So we are halfway through um, our show. So it's time for our mid show reminders. 
Um, you are watching Blackhawks Banter presented by the Hockey Writers. I'm your host, Brooke Laferno, here with Connor Smith, and we are talking all things Blackhawks. Make sure to um, subscribe to our morning skate newsletter uh, where you get hockey content to your email Monday through Friday. The link will be in the description below. It's morningskate.io. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, especially for the upcoming games. We want to talk to you guys. We want to hear your thoughts everything. So be sure to follow us and be sure to look up our content on the hockeywriters.com for all of our Blackhawks articles. So that brings me to my next thing, because this is actually an article of mine, but I had to talk about it because I feel like this just can't be ignored anymore. And it's about Jonathan Taze. Um, he seems to keep speaking, um, whether it's a little good or a little bad, I don't know, but it's, it's not very good right now, but he's been speaking twice this past week. Um, about kind of making kind of discouraging comments about his future and about the team's direction. And it just seems like he's very unhappy. Um, and that's not really good to hear. And he's usually pretty mild mannered and doesn't speak more than he has to. So for him to speak out twice in the span of a week and make kind of comments like these was a little, uh, we got to talk about this because you just can't be ignored anymore. So what do you kind of make of his comments that he's been saying lately? You know, I think it's a really tough situation, but you have to look at it in perspective. I think there's two sides to it. For the first half of his career, it maybe it sounds a little cliche, but let's face it, all Jonathan Taves knew, and when I say career, obviously, I mean his Blackhawks center, all he knew was winning. You know, you have three cups by 2015. He was 27 years old. And since then, they haven't won a playoff round. I mean, obviously, this rebuild is still very early, very new, but They've really, I think the best way to put it is they've been mired in mediocrity since. So it's a tough situation because you don't know at this point whether this rebuild is going to work out. I mean, let's face it. You look at Buffalo, who they've been struggling for like a decade now, or even Edmonton, even, you know, they're probably going to make the playoffs, but they've kind of been floundering, even with guys like McDavid and Dreisaitl, who are these generational talents. So I think a lot of it comes with that uncertainty that, okay, we don't know how this is going to look like. We don't know how it's going to play out. So I totally, you know, sympathize him. It's a hard situation to be in. On the other hand, I think um, I was reading an article from second city hockey and they raised this point, you know, those character traits, those comments like that, which I get it. It's brutally honest. You want to hear that sometimes, but it raises the question, okay, is Taves the right captain right now for this rebuild? Because you look at Patrick Kane, I mean, he said a few times um, he wants to embrace this rebuild. It sure sounds like he wants to stay around. Um, and he was asked about his future too. And he kind of brushed it off like, oh, not right now. I'm focused on the, um, you know, right now, which I totally understand. And then you have other guys like Debrinkit, uh, Seth Jones, who are probably going to be prominent fixtures of this rebuild and, you know, hopefully here the next time the Hawks contend again. And I'm not saying, you know, Jonathan Taves, by all means, I still think is a great leader. He's definitely not the player he once was, but it really makes it tough for, you know, the leadership group, um, you know, at coach, whether King stays around next year, they bring in a new face or Kyle Davidson, the general manager too, because you have to analyze those comments and it, it makes you think, okay, is Jonathan Taves really the right guy to be this captain? Because you look at it too, his contract's up next summer. Obviously you have that $10.5 million cap it. So if, you know, by all means, if you try to move him, you're probably going to have to eat some of that. So I don't know. Um, it's definitely a tough situation, not just for Jonathan Taves, but also Kyle Davidson for Coach King and whoever takes those shoes next year. It could very well be King, but a new voice too. But I think to kind of end this off, a lot of it is the heat of the moment. You know, he said something along the lines of, I think it was, it was a little disheartening on Wednesday, um, kind of referring to, seeing Brandon Hagel and seeing Marc-Andre Fleury, Ryan Carpenter leave. And, you know, everyone, I would think mostly everyone feels that way at the deadline when you have these guys like uh, Carpenter, who's been around here for almost three seasons go. So I think you have to kind of look at it that way too, in that, okay, you know, it was a rough trade deadline, you know, not in the sense of the trades, but seeing guys leave. So 
I don't know. I think it really echoes a lot of fans. I think anyone would be in that situation that, you know, oh, you're seeing a friend go whatever, but I, I think time will really tell. And this is definitely going to be a very interesting situation with Jonathan Taves and what his future looks like, because right now I, I don't know. I could see it going either way. Yeah, it is interesting for sure. And do you know what his comments, the first time he spoke was kind of more like, this direction is kind of disheartening, but it kind of just is what it is and no one feels safe and everything that he was saying was kind of like, okay, yeah, that's kind of how most fans were feeling. And then the second time he spoke, I kind of got, I don't know what the right word is here, but I felt kind of more compassion for him in the first half. And then the second comments that he made, I was kind of like, okay, I don't know what you kind of expect from this team at this point, because with rebuilds, things are going to get worse before they get better. That just is what it is. But unfortunately, because of the previous general manager, they've been stuck in a rebuild for the past like five years. So oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I get like the anger there. And I guess it's nice that he said that, at least because if you're going into a rebuild, you want to know who's in and who's out. And if he's out, you want to know that prior to going into next season. But part of what he was saying about, I could picture myself, it's hard not to picture myself playing with another team at this point and just kind of stuff like that. I'm kind of like, you know what? You're still here. You're still the captain and it is a bad situation for sure. I can't imagine how their locker room feels knowing that they're kind of still stuck in this place of just being not a good team, but you know what? You still have a job to do. It is what it is. And Mm -hmm. I don't, kind of didn't sit well with me because you got young players in that locker room that need kind of leadership and not that kind of apathy where he kind of seems a little burned out. And, you know, he's been there for 14 years. There might be some burnout there. It might be time for a change. But so, like I said, I'm glad he's saying this now. So at least management maybe has an idea that maybe he doesn't want to be here. And like I said, there's aspects about his health and his age and stuff. I don't think he can afford to wait 10 more years. He needs to win now. He can't wait. So you know what? I hope actually that they do find a situation that works for both sides, because if he's here and unhappy, that just hurts the team as much as it hurts him. So um, I hope that this doesn't like seep into the locker room where players can see that their captain is unhappy and just hope that I really kind of hope no more comments from here on out until the end of the season, because I'm kind of burned out listening to him because it's very disheartening and you don't want to hear that from your captain at all. It's sad. I know we all feel it, we're all kind of disheartened by the team in the season, but trying to stay positive by any chance you can get. So, okay. Sorry guys. I had to rant there. <laughs> There's a lot to dissect there. I'm sure you guys, your fans are uh, venting too. It's a safe space. You guys can message us vent with us. It's a safe space. We're here for you. Okay. So that, <laughs> that, that fun topic now leads us into the shootout round. Uh, quick answers, quick fire answers. Um, this is not Jonathan Taze related. <laughs> We're uh-huh. past that. Um, so ready, Connor, for the shootout? Yeah, I'm ready. Have at it. Yeah. Okay. So first question of the shootout. The Blackhawks face Buffalo uh tonight, Monday, which by the time you guys see this will be Tuesday. Florida, Panthers, Tampa Bay Lightning, and the Arizona Coyotes this week. It's a pretty busy week. Mm-hmm. How many points do you think they will get this week? I'm going to say four points. I think that's a pretty safe bet. Yeah, I'm going to go with that too. I said four points uh, last week and it actually turned out pretty good. So I'm going to stick with that. I think they'll win against Buffalo and I'm going to say Arizona too. I know they didn't beat them last time, but I'm going to stick to it. Hopefully positive premonitions will just continue to push them the right way. Okay. Second question of the shootout. Dylan Strome continues to ride the hot hand with 10 goals in his last 12 games, including um, one against the Golden Knights. How many goals do you think he will have this week? Let's keep the hot hand going. I'm going to say three goals. I think that's a safe bet. I could see a couple goals against Buffalo and Arizona. I know they said Strom's a player that might struggle more with um, better teams, but Mm -hmm. you know what? He kind of broke through that against Vegas, I think. So I think that's a very safe bet. I'll go four. If he broke through Vegas, I think he might have something up his sleeve with Tampa Bay and Florida. You never know. And it, you know what? He's playing with Kane, so anything's possible. It could be eight goals. Who knows? Um, so third question of the shootout. The Buffalo Sabres. I'm sorry, guys. This is turning into the Buffalo Sabres shootout round. But uh-huh. I got a lot to say. Sorry about that. The Buffalo Sabres is Patrick Kane's hometown. And he does well against them very well. He has 11 goals and 24 points in 18 career games against them. How many points does he get? 
Well, I'm going to be laughing at this because this is coming out, you know, Tuesday and the game is Monday tonight. Um, I could probably go higher with this, but uh, I'm going to play it safe here. I'm going to say two points. I'm going to say two points, too. And it's not because I don't think he could get more. He definitely could. But Buffalo has been kind of hot yeah. lately. But um, the Blackhawks, I know, have been 15-1 and one against them in their career. But um, or lately anyways, but like I said, Buffalo has been kind of hot lately. They beat Toronto twice. They beat Vegas, Calgary, Minnesota. I mean, they're onto something. So I think two is a safe bet, at least two, I think two is the, um, minimum, but it could be three. Who knows? We'll see. Um, yeah, you guys watching, you guys are probably laughing at us now because it'll be Tuesday and the game <laughs> will be over. <laughs> um, but, uh, so Taylor Radish and Boris Kachuk will face their former team the Tampa Bay Lightning, and Brandon Hagel will play the Hawks for the first time since he is now on Tampa Bay. Which one of these players is more likely to score against their former team first? So I think there's no doubt that Brandon Hagel is the best player, or at least the most well-rounded player out of all the three. Um, I'm actually going to play, I don't know what you think, but I'm actually going to play a little bit of devil's advocate here and say Radish or Kachuk, um, and just because – I think, again, you know, Hagel's a great player, but maybe it's a situation where they're coming in, they're rebuilding. It's like, all right, let's show our old team what we can do. Some yeah, I'm going to go with Radish too, um, but only because Hagel's not getting as much playing time with Tampa Bay as he did here, right. and that's not a knock on him. It's just the way it is. And Radish, like you said, is on to something. He's kind of riding a hot hand here, so maybe we'll see. But I kind of see him scoring first, but watch Brandon Hagel will score like three goals, and then we'll be laughing. But – yeah, I kind of see that happening more, I think. But that'll be a fun game. I'm actually excited about that. I think it'll be really fun to see Hagel again, see what kind of these two teams bring now that they got former players on each side. It should be a really chippy matchup. And finally, the last question of the shootout. Again, not Buffalo related. How would you assign the goalies for the back-to-back -back against Florida and Tampa Bay on Thursday and Friday? I know it doesn't mean much, but just how would you assign it? Yeah, I would say Lankinen for Thursday's game against Florida and then Delia Friday on Tampa, just because, again, I do think it's pretty obvious Lankinen is the more well-rounded of the two of them. And I think of the two opponents, I mean, there are two teams. I put them in Colorado, both in, if you were to name a super team in the NHL, both in that category. And of course, neither of these are must-win games, but I would say Lankinen against Florida, just because I think He's the better of the two, and Florida at this point, don't get me wrong, Tampa's great, but they are a little bit more complete, I think, especially as of late. So I'd go one-two um, in that order, Lincoln and Delia for the the uh, back-to-back. Okay, so I'm going to go a little different from you, and I would say keep Lincoln in for the back-to-back. -back. I know King said that okay. he wanted him to have a back-to-back -back at some point, but if you really are invested in him being the guy, you got to put him against these good teams. And I just said I want to see more of Delia, but I would have him start against Buffalo and Arizona. I know Lincoln is starting against um, Buffalo tonight, but that's kind of how I would round it out there. Um, but we'll see actually I'm excited to see what he does there because I think that could go either way but if it were to go Lincoln and Adelia I would do the same thing put Lincoln in against Florida and Delia against Tampa because the Hawks actually seem like they match well with Tampa a lot better than expected the Bolts are obviously better mm -hmm. better team in every aspect but they don't seem as like floundered against them as Florida maybe so we'll see well it, be goes back, it goes back to your last point too in that you know Delia we don't really know what his future is going to look like Maybe, again, I know you said, you know, Lincoln in with the back-to-back, -back, but maybe play him against a team like Tampa, just kind of, again, gauge the waters a little because LA is a pretty good team. And I mean, 43, 46, that's pretty darn good. So maybe yeah. he does it against Tampa. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, we do have some fun storylines to keep following. So fans, I know if you feel dejected because of what's going on, we still have some fun things to look forward to, or at least look out for. And hopefully, um, we can unplug the team and plug it back in from Vegas to start over again. And let's see what they can do against these good teams. Cause that's the true test of the rebuild is seeing how you can match up against these players. So uh, that will wrap up our Blackhawks banter show of the day. Thank you guys so much for watching and tweeting with us and sending us comments. We read everyone. We try to respond to them. So make sure you tweet with us through the games. We'll be live on Twitter. We want to hear all your thoughts. Please let us know your thoughts on the topics that we talked about today. Um, my name is Brooke Laferno. Thank you again, Connor, so much for joining us. I had a blast and we will see more of Connor this season. So Absolutely. I'm excited about that. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Bring it on. Yep. Yeah. So yes, again, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Have a great night. Go Hawks.